All right. Hey, so this is Rad, and we are on Fired Up with Rad, and my guest today is Jeff Kirkham. Uh, Jeff Kirkham is a veteran of the United States Army, and he also is an entrepreneur, and we're going to get to know Jeff uh, here on Fired Up with Rad. Hey, so Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Hey, well, welcome, and I, I just want you to know that uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show today, and I just want to get to know you and uh, figure out a little bit about you. What do you say about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm I'm an entrepreneur. I reinvent myself after the mill, and I run a couple of different businesses now. I'm a silent partner on Black Rifle Coffee, so Evan and I started that up, and then he is the genius, without a doubt, behind that company that um, caused it to hockey stick and move forward. And I'm the I'm the guy by you know in the closet that they ask me if they need new products, and then I also run um, Ready Man, which is survival and survivalism and preppers and emergency preparedness and we've got close to a thousand tutorial videos now and then um, i'm also the inventor of the rats tourniquet mm -hmm. and which we, i'm well aware of that's it, a very good system it, that it, can be used to it, save lives and we've sold that uh are we we're selling that now worldwide um and it was born out of working in afghanistan in uh, special operations mm -hmm. And um, where you it, needed one, right? Where we needed one, yeah. Where we needed where we needed a solution for working. You know, where you're scared in the dark. You know, it's all of a sudden you lose your technical and fine motor skills, mm -hmm. and so uh, it was one of those solutions. At least it was my solution, a better mousetrap to what we had been issued, so that um, you know, so that we could render care under fire. So let's just kind of pause right there and talk about that. So you're issued equipment in the military. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, somebody purchased this for you that you had no say over. And then all of a sudden they give it to you on a mission. They're like, use this. It's supposed to do whatever it is it's supposed to do. And you get it and you're like, well, let me maybe duct tape it and wrap some paracord around it. And now it's what I need. Well, I think I think the term is is Bayesian analytics. And so there's this guy, you know, that came across and said, you know, I've got I've got this I've got this item to solve a problem that works phenomenally well in a, you know, in X setting. Usually that setting is in the light, not, not much stress. Um, and you've been trained, you know, you just got done practicing with it. And, and then Bainesian came in and he was like, well, you've got to, you can't really look at things that way. You've got to take a totality of system of, uh, of, of impetus and, and with different, you know, what's the word I'm looking for with a totality of all of the input that you're getting at the time. Mm -hmm. So scared in the dark under fire. Sure. And so, you know, for and a lot of the items that we have in the military are that way they work out fantastic. And, and actually I would argue now is way better than it was. So I joined the military back in the eighties and, you know, we we're just coming out of Vietnam. So it wasn't so bad, but through the nineties, we really ran into equipment that worked phenomenally well in the clinical setting, but didn't work so well in the, oh, crap, I'm scared in the dark under fire setting. And so we, we you know, fast forward, I was in a unit where we would um, recruit tribesmen out of the mountains and essentially turn them into commandos. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that was medical. And so we would we had issues with the tourniquet we were being issued because – you know, you start getting really clumsy with your 10 digits when you're under stress. Yeah, I can imagine. It's like uh, there's no manual to probably put somebody's brains back in their head when it's in your lap. Yeah. It's like, wh where's that in the manual? So, and I reference a friend of mine who is a combat medic, and he had told me the same type of thing. He's like, hey, there's nothing in the manual for that situation. Like, there he is. He's in my lap. And it's like, what do I do with this? And that, and that leads to, you know, creativity. And I think that's really where special operations, you know, not that, not that they're smarter or faster or stronger than anybody else, but they, but they get the latitude due to the leadership mm -hmm. to exercise creativity. And so like essentially the study that I like to think about or that I quote all the time was the OSS, the office of strategic services in world war two, these guys were doing the most, hair raising operations in world war two like literally they get one or two guys they'd parachute into the middle of the jungle and their mission was get the indigenous forces to start fighting against the japanese 
and yeah, the, and that was us. it. I mean, it was like crazy. The beginning of the whole special operations it, and it was unconventional and, warfare and the OSS, tactics. They are what turned into today's CIA and mm-hmm. the Green Berets. Right. And so the OSS at that time were, and you can say the first special service force, kind of they more morphed into today's Green Berets. And today's Green Berets and the and the Ranger Battalion, the Rangers were out of there, but not really in the attitude that they are today. No, and Kennedy realized that need of the Green Beret and reestablished them back in the fi- or late 50s. Yes, and which in the 50 figure 1952 right. when Special Forces was coming online, you're talking, I mean, the war ended in 45. Right. So we're talking like five years later, they were already spinning up guys to go in and organize. Fort Bragg was train. being yep. developed into the Special Warfare Training Center, yep. and uh, and the rest is history. And the rest is history. True and story. But, you know, looking back at the OSS, they did all these studies because they kept losing guys, right? Guys and gals. So Gloria Childs, the famous lady from the cooking show, was an OSS. Right. And there's agent. also, uh, I just read an article about another lady who is still alive, I think. And she had dropped in and she was just uh, yeah. SAS. Yeah. Was was working essentially the partner force of the OSS. Right. They're in the British. And but she's airborne. She has a whole rack of ribbons and she's yeah, got her jump wings. Just done unbelievable British stuff. Jump wings. Never wore a uniform day no. in her life. And, um, you know, the, so these, you know, they're constantly trying to figure out, it's like, what will increase the survivability of these guys? Who do we need to look for? So it was like the initial selection process. So this myth that Hollywood pushed out of these guys were like criminals and street thugs and stuff. Nothing could be the dirty dozen, the The dirty dozen, nothing could be further from the truth. So, so the studies have all shown like actually people who come from good families that are mm -hmm. solid with get it. They, they all did, they all performed and had a higher survivability rate. And on the OSS side, they figured out that those who had a high level of creativity survived and those who didn't, didn't. And so the number one determining factor of a successful OSS agent was creativity. And that was Just it. Just like thinking outside the box, like adapting to the situation, overcoming to the trials and tribulations that are presented in front of them. There's a river. Get across it. It's yes. like, okay, well, we'll just lay you across it, and I'll get across you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so I think I think through, like, a lot of the stuff I had, I was lucky enough where I had a, a command structure that didn't inhibit creativity or innovative thought or the evolution of Maybe stuff. Maybe encouraged it even. They, they actually, they encouraged it. So right. I look at, you know, I was, you know, I was in special forces, and then I was in law enforcement a little bit, and then I went back to special forces and special operations. All of my bosses were like, figure it out. And when you figure it out, come tell us so that we can tell everybody else how to do it. And then when we come up with other problems, Mm -hmm. figure it out. Right. Get creative. Get creative. Yeah. And And, and, and think outside of, because you're creating it. Because you're creating it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, here's the, who created the manual? Yeah. Well, I got to think outside the box on, well, this is how the steps should go. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I remember, you know, when I was in the, so I spent 13 years in a, in a direct action counter terrorist unit and, um, and we specialized in working with indigenous forces. And at one point, you know, we had this problem that came up where we needed a crew serve weapon, which is a machine gun, a belt fed machine gun, uh-huh. but we needed something that we could conceal. Right. And so we were issued um, former Soviet bloc weapons and, um, you know, and the PK machine gun is what we're, you know, is what we're running around with. So this PK, you know, the PK is, it's smaller than a mag 58, the M two four zero, you know, right. but, um, but it's, you know, it's With a the big green box mag on the bottom big green of it. Bakes mag. Right. Yep, Just to exactly. kind of explain that wooden handle that's kind of carved out yep, the wooden the stock, stock. Yep. Right. Yep. And, yep. You know, it's like cherry wood almost. And, and I, and I was in a unit and like guys that are in the military are going to cringe here in a minute, but I literally got a chop saw and I got, I got a barrel off that PK and I chopped the end of the, of the barrel off. Saw and, it I, off. and I went out to the range and I shot it and I was like, it still works. And then I got, and then I came <laughs> back and I chopped off another inch of that barrel and I went out to the range and I shot it and it was like, well, it still works. And then I came back and I chopped off another inch. Now, anybody that's been in the military, you start chopping barrels like the supply sergeants in the armor right. guy is going to have like an annual. Is that how I issued that to you? Well, it's like you, do, <laughs> you're going, you're coming up on charges. Whereas my leadership was like, oh, okay. And so we got this right. PK down to the size of a paratrooper saw. Sure. So we had a seven six two fifty four crew serve machine gun that was the size of the American 
two forty nine five para that had that sliding in stock and, that and, you could put and in we and knocked out. the stock off the thing right, and, we, and we and we fabricated one that would uh that would fold on it and stuff so we ended up with this p k machine gun that was like this big and you know and then we came up with a cloth box on the bottom but my whole point on that is I had the leadership that was there that that didn't hold back innovation they right. encouraged it right they were like uh, go ahead. Yeah, that looks great. Yeah. You did a good job on that. Yeah. Right? And again, it, it was made one way, and everybody just looks at it, and it should always stay that way. I kind of say this with the with the wheel, right? It's like you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just have to add snow studs to it, and then all of a sudden you can resell it as a whole new <laughs> yeah. snow tire. Snow tires. Right? It's like why create the wheel all over again when you can just maybe add a little, like, seeped tread into it, yeah. and now you have some grippiness yeah. on it, right? So uh, just because it's – made that way doesn't mean it has to always stay that, that way. way exactly yeah. hence why i would say that uh, i would imagine in an armory of sf guys special forces like they're out of duct tape and paracord yeah because they're like i'm tying it up well and, and you think you think ma you know you think special forces 100 mile an hour tape for you out there they're gonna be crit critical of duct tape it's 100 tape. mile an hour tape i get duct it tape. i know i know but you know special forces <laughs> so and this is like you know and, and jason's gonna be on one of your shows coming up here but there's only one special forces in the military. That's there's, right. There's other special operations. There's only one special forces. That is so true. And we wear green berets. That is what's up. And that's a hat. And, and that's a hat. That's a hat. The title you earn is United States Special Forces. Yes. And that is what's up. That's the tab. But the hat that you wear, it's it's a it's a hat. It's a hat. It's given to you yeah, from the British yeah. Marines. Really. But, the green but beret. anymore, we've got to say I was a green beret, so that anybody, you know, because special forces has kind of become. You know, this all-encompassing, like, Xerox. Right. Well, like, pararescue is not special forces. Uh, Navy SEALs are not special forces. Special forces are the United States Army special forces. And we wear a green beret. And you wear a green beret to identify yeah. and stand out. And, and those guys are special operations. and agreed. they're And they're great Americans, and they're doing a phenomenal job, and they're doing a job that— But that classification I mean, is reserved. For the for United the, States Special Forces, te guy. technically yeah. speaking, yes. yes. Technically that, well, that's speaking. what matters. <laughs> Math one and one is two. Can, technically I, speaking, I can hear I can hear brains exploding right I, now. I hope so. Podcast, okay, but, just film it. But it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then upload it so we can watch that, right? Because it's true. The USSF is who they are, and then everything else follows underneath, like SOCOM or and it's, Spec Ops. And it's a completely different breed, too. I, I would argue where, you know. Because, like a lot of times when special forces go out, you live in very austere conditions. You're living with the indigenous mm. forces, you know. And so, like a lot of times, you're not in the best of shape because, I mean, you just got over whatever weird gombu sickness tapeworm, that came in or tapeworm. Yeah. And the resupply didn't come in right. or the resupply was like a bunch of Spuntmeyer uh, muffins. And you're living off of like rice and raisins because that's all you can get off the local well, economy. Because that's what they have. Because that's what they have. Yeah. And then you get sick because the guy who's cooking it, you know, is using, you know, he's using his pocket knife to clean his toenails. And right. Then, and then he's cutting up the, he's the, he's the vegetables you, to go into tea. The, have some tea, but it comes from the poisoned well, but it's our tea. It's like, wait, whoa. Did you boil that for 20 yeah, minutes? Yeah, just drink what and, you just... And it's like you're sitting across the thing from a shake that, you know, this guy like literally controls your survivability of like, if we can win this guy over, mm -hmm. then, then we're going to be heroes and we're going to have a whole bunch of guys and that are going to live. They're going to come fight with us. Mm -hmm. But if I don't win this guy over, then guess what? Then uh, there's a whole bunch of guys that are now going to want to come wow. fight me. And, and, and that's intense. Get, yeah, it's a it's a I mean constant. not literally in a tent, probably, but I mean like that's intense. <laughs> yeah, and right? so they hand you like I remember vividly, you know, we were we were eating lunch next to this river and next to this hotel and this guy, you know, and you sit down on the you sit down on the rug or whatever and you're eating the food with your, you know, with your hand, your right hand cuz they don't use the utensils. Okay. And um there's a guy that that's serving us and he's throwing down flatbread. And he's walking between the dishes on this, you know, on this rug that we're sitting on and he's not wearing shoes and he's got like super gnarly feet and, you know, and he's throwing, he's throwing bread down on the, uh, on the thing. And it's kind of like, well, 
okay. I mean, a little foot fungus never hurt anybody. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, and, and uh, there's, the, there's these different dishes out in front of us, right? And um, I look at this one, and you're kind of looking for, the, like, the safest dish, Like, right? what can I eat, yeah. What can I eat, and what's not going to make me too horribly what sick? What is that, first of what all? What is that? Yeah, and so exactly. I, and I look rice. down, I'm I like, eat rice. it's chicken. <laughs> uh, so it's like okay. chicken. So I'm like, okay, so I pick up this chunk of chicken, you know, because they have kebabs, right? Sure. And so I, I pop this chunk of chicken in my mouth, and I bite into it. And I'm like, that is not chicken. And it doesn't taste very good. Oh, what was it? And so I'm like, okay, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to swallow them. Okay, everything's good. And then like five minutes later, like the same dish gets put in front of one of the other advisors, right? And and he goes to pick it up. And one of the other Afghans that was there, he was like, he starts laughing. He's like, you know what that is? And the guy's like, no. And I'm sitting here like, Please don't say anything. Please don't, don't say, say anything. It. Please don't just say let me anything. just swallow it. And he's like, those are goat balls. Nice. Right? Huh? <laughs> you know, at that moment, it was like, <laughs> was it chewy? Can you describe what it tasted like? It, it like, kind of like burst in my mouth. Like a, like really? Yeah. It was vile, bro. I'm telling you it was vile. Was it like deep fried or just like cooked? No, it, boiled? Was, it was like cooked on, boiled a, on a kebab. It was goat balls. Goat yeah. balls. And it was like. Yeah, I mean, I you know, it's like, okay. We have Rocky I'm gonna, Mountain I'm gonna, oysters I'm gonna, around I'm gonna, here. And I don't eat those either. Those are like sheep balls, right? Rocky Mountain oysters <laughs> deep fried. I think they're pay or uh, bull balls, bull balls or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? It was one of those moments, though, where it's like these seem, this same group of people, and this, and, and on the other side of that is like this unbelievably rewarding experience. Whereas, like, these these guys from this tribe literally carved my name in the side of a mountain because they thought so highly of me. And so it's that's awesome. It's one of those things where it's like, whoa, I don't I don't know if to be worried or go on some ego trip. They're like, this guy, that's who we're after this guy, right here. Like, like Carving literally it in. Like literally my name was carved in this big friggin' rock on the side of a mountain. It goes Petra. And then Jeff Kirkham. <laughs> well, it wasn't, it wasn't quite that artistic. But it was like, but they, you know, it's like civil affairs dudes and stuff sure. would be like, who's who's this dude? And they're like, oh, he's a good friend of our, it was the up in the Panchir Valley. And so got a lot of friends up there. Panchir Valley was never taken by the Soviets. Okay. It was never taken by the Taliban. It's absolutely magnificent uh, when you, when you go when it's in not under fire, when it's, well, the Panchir is never really under fire. So mm -hmm. when you go into the Panchir Valley, there was, you know, you've got a road that just barely two vehicles could pass on. It, if you had a truck and a vehicle, they were within inches apart. And on one side, you had a cliff that went about 10,000 feet up. Hmm. And on the other side, you had a huge river, the Panchir river. And the Pancher River had all these rapids in it. And if you looked really close, what was causing the rapids tanks. was a whole bunch I of old you. dead Russian tanks. Yeah, I knew was it. The, I was it. the rapid. So I, I used to dream about I want to go whitewater kayaking through a bunch of old dead T Russian tanks. T T55. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, I'm just place. thinking like T37s yeah. or something along yeah, those lines. T34s, Anything with a T yeah, in it. Yep. Yeah. And and um but so like when you drive hmm. in there and you know, and there's and there's Pancheries that are sitting right there at the mouth of the, uh, of the Pancher Valley. And if you're not a Pancher, you're not an American, you don't come in. Don't even go in there. Don't. Yeah. There's like, we're so not the really Pancher, in. are they still Afghani? Yeah. Yeah. So Afghanistan is interesting. It's, uh, it's almost like a melting pot, kind of like in the U S kind of. So you have Tajiks and Uzbeks and, and um pakistani pa probably Pashtuns. well the pakistanis you know you have the punjabis the punjabis they, they don't really come over in afghanistan punjabis are, are more to the east but you have the Pashtuns that are part of so like old afghanistan actually extended way far into pakistan mm. and that's part of the conflict that's going on right now between afghanistan and pakistan with the duran line and stuff without getting into the chloroform of history but but so, and then you, you've got the Hazaras and they kind of look like Mongolians and they, they speak their own language and there's a bunch of different dialects. So there's two different main languages in Afghanistan. You've got the, you've got Dari and Pashto. Dari and Pashto. Yeah. So the, the language of the country, the official language is Dari, mm -hmm. which is kind of like old Farsi that they speak in Iran. And, um, you know, so it's kind of like old English to English. And then, and then you have Pashto. And then in Pashto, 
is in the southern Afghanistan, all the way up on the eastern side of Afghanistan. And um, um, and they have different dialects that are theirs, too. And do you speak those di- Do you speak those languages? I, at one point, I could. I mean, now, I mean, I'd be hard-pressed to put two words together. So at one point, I was actually pretty good at Pashto. I could, mm-hmm. I could, it would be me and I would have 50 of my um, Afghan commandos assaulting targets. 50 and, Afghan commandos assaulting targets. Um, and so Farsi is kind of like an old language that it really is. isn't even. Yeah, it's the old Persian language. Right, and if you know. know that language, then you're like old school. You're, yeah, you're like, you're like, what do they call that, OG? Yeah, like, OG, original, original gangster. gangster. Yeah. You're like Farsi, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, because you remember it was the Persians that were invading Greece mm-hmm. that made you know the Spartans famous with the whole saying of Molon Labi with uh, you know King Xerxes the second was coming in and told uh, and that just means come and take it from come me. take it you yeah know, just come like, and take they it. were like Spartans throw down your weapons and right they said Molon Labi come, like I'm here come, come get it come get them yep and, I'm right here yeah. waiting for you with my yeah. swords on the three hundred on that uh, the the three hundred Spartans yeah the right yeah. the gates of hell. Yeah, well, gates of fire. The gates of fire. Yeah, so there's there's a uh, hot there's hot pots that are there, like mm-hmm. uh, you know hot springs that are there. So they called it the gates of fire. It was a narrow pass. I hear there's still the ability to just walk along the beach and find arrowheads and remnants of all of the oh, wow. of the war. Yeah, I have friends that march that once a year, oh, and cool. they're SAX guys over there. So yeah. they're always looking for groups of people to get together and do this march. You know, like it's a bunch of friends, but they all wear the same gear. They all have the shields, yeah. the helmets, the uh, red cool. sashes. And that's they're like, cool. don't worry about bringing any metal detectors or anything because you'll find something. Really? Yeah. Well, they said that, like at the point, I mean, this was 2,000 years ago or something, but the, the, the Persians shot so many arrows that it blotted out the sun. Right. And that was even brought into the movie uh, 300, the 300, right? Where they yeah. had that whole uh, battery of arrows coming in, blocking out the sun. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, the, and the Spartans were laughing because they're like, oh, we'll fight in the shade. Yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, you block out the sun, then we'll fight in the shade. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. But that's life in special forces. It really is. I mean, you get exposed to all of these different cultures. You get exposed to learning a different language. Learning a different language is a phenomenal experience. I would encourage it to anybody because you, you figure on its very on its most basic level you double your vocabulary mm-hmm. and there are language and there are words in other languages that we don't have in the in the english language and so you you have to kind of think a little bit differently on what you're doing and how you handle different people and it's it's a fascinating right, because you don't want to offend anyone you're over there on a mission you, to you don't want to like offend anybody a, and, an intermayor. but you've got to be strong i mean you've got to be you know we used to call it uh Firm, fair, and final, Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're dealing with these guys. Because a lot of them would push you to see if you're, you know, it's almost like prison rules. They want that promise. Well, (laughs) they'd push you to see if they could punk you. And so it's like you're, it's this constant back and Mm -hmm. forth because if they can punk you and you're a punk, you don't have any respect. Right. But if you push too far back, then now all of a sudden you've been disrespectful from them. And, sure. and now it's like, well, like, you know, okay, you, you were disrespectful for me. I've got to kill you. So friendly, firm, and just yeah, firm, straight up. F- firm, fair, and final. Firm, fair. So this is what's up. That's what's fair. And that's my final offer. Yeah, that's it. That's it. It's and like, that's no, what I got. I, no, I can't do that. Yeah, sorry. Why can't you do that? I can't do that because it's against my culture. It's against my right. rules. I'm a soldier. You I don't know, have access to anything happen. like that. Sorry. And it's this constant thing where we're teaching young special forces soldiers of how to handle situations just like that. Because, and, and it's like you literally, like the final phase in special forces training is called Robin Sage. Mm-hmm. And so you go into this fictitious land that's called Pineland. And you run this exercise for like a month where you're essentially you land, you go in, you meet your G chief, the gorilla chief, gorilla, not gorilla. Mm-hmm. You meet the, the gorilla chief the and, you, and you've, the GU and yeah. you've got to win him over right. through, you know, building relationships hmm. and trust and the, and the I wonder what's that, that's like, interesting. Hmm. It's yeah. <laughs> Give me your glasses. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right? But you've got to, but it's that fine balance of, of back and forth. that's that's there. It's, it's really, it's an art and a science. Robin it, Sage takes place in like North Carolina or yeah, something, yeah, doesn't it? Isn't yeah, that right they, of Bragg, And, and yeah. the whole town living there is like, hey, this is happening yeah. and they're all so, part of it. 
So one of the guys that was, you know, so you have auxiliary units. Mm-hmm. Not, I won't get too deep into running. Yeah, um, nothing. Don't give away warfare. anything. Just it doesn't matter. I could tell you everything, and it'd still be like a puzzle to you. But, um, <laughs> but you know, we had our G chief, and then we had our auxiliary force that was supporting us on our efforts and stuff. And our G chief was a guy who was a retired colonel that had been in the Bay of Pigs. Oh, wow, Cuba. So 60s fascinating guy to sit around the fire, build rapport with and learn sure. from. Wow. Like, yeah. I mean, the Bay of Pigs. Yeah. Bay of Pigs. Where yeah. were you in the Bay of Pigs? And you know? he was right in the, this guy was right in the thick, you know, we were sleeping in, like his, the whole Cuban in his chicken situation, coop. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's the, and that is the cool stuff like in special forces, probably more so than any place in the military. You know, maybe maybe Delta, maybe I don't even know there where you you meet these guys that are just like legends and you're like, holy, like I heard about you. (laughs) I've heard about you. And there you are. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because they'll bring in guys like Wally Uh that's here, you know, like Wally Wally works here at Black Rifle, works here at Black Rifle. Ready Man. And, And Wally has done the most hair raising stuff that you could ever imagine. No, he's... Um, and he's like the nicest guy dude, I working, hugged him. working down the hall. He told me some stories. And this guy, the stuff that he used to do for the USG, he used to do for us, like, I mean, like literally... You needed guys like him to do the things that he did. Absolutely. Yeah, because that's what's up. I just want to say that. Yeah, Because he told me a little bit about himself, Wally. That would be someone who maybe uh, we'll see on the show. You should, uh, On yeah. uh, Fired Up uh, with Rad. Was, we'll get yeah. Wally in here, dude. A big old <laughs> hug. And uh, awesome. he'll tell some stories about, you know, uh, uh, him being 17 and fighting against the Russians. Yeah. Right here to yeah. kind of elaborated and losing his family members yeah. as well. I mean, what would you do if you lost your family and Fight. there was an f- invading force coming in yeah. that Fight. didn't care about you? Fight. Yeah. Right. What's your democracy now? It's his AK. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. And then he became a battalion commander and yeah, yeah Wally, a whole nother story whole on nother Wally, story. right? And let one, alone. And one of my very, very dear friends. And those of you that are just joining us on this, uh, on this interview, this is Jeff Kirkham, uh, former United States special forces, uh, Master Sergeant. Yeah, he uh, got out as a Master Sergeant. 18 Bravo, which is an armorer. No, 18 oh. Bravo is a weapon sergeant. Weapons. And then I was an 18 Zulu for uh, 13. So I was a team sergeant for. I right, know, I was going to say Zulu was the team sergeant, right? Yeah, I'm team sergeant. That's yeah. right. Like yeah. over that. So I went to Ranger School and I was Halo qualified and I was scuba qualified and. You know, I did all the schools. And HALO, and for those stuff. of you that are hearing these acronyms, that stands for High Altitude Low Opening. Yep. And there's also Hey Ho, right, which is High Altitude High, high Opening. opening. Yep. Those are the guys that wear the oxygen masks on their face yep. that are jumping out um, with the sun in the lowering of the C-130. Yep. And it's like yeah, so Charlie I, Sheen. I, I stepped off the ramp at <laughs> 29,000, yep. essentially 30,000 30, feet, feet in the middle of the night. Yeah, Yeah. so that's a question I want to ask. Like, what is the most hairy jump that you dealt with, like, did you ever cigarette roll on a static line jump? So, did you ever? So here you go. Have hangups? So here you go. Yeah, I want to hear. I it. remember it vividly. Yeah, like please. It was yesterday. Yeah. So my very first free fall. Mm-hmm. My very first free fall. And I that's was Halo. I was was well. I was actually I was at skydive. I was skydiving. Okay. So I was like, well, I want to learn how to skydive before I go to Halo school or military free fall school. So my very first free fall jump, I was at a civilian drop zone, but it was owned and run by a SF guy who was in group with me. I was there with my team, uh, 145. And um, so I jump out, you know, so y- you go through and you get all in the, you watch videos of what the different malfunctions are and stuff. And, and, um, and like I'd done a ton of static line jumps up to then, but never a free fall. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, Go out of the airplane, you know, body pose and all this stuff. And um, um, I look up, you know, so I, I pull, well, the chute gets pulled for me because the first ones are like, sta- they're kind of static. They're kind of half. They like a trail. Half. It's being pulled out yeah, of the plane. And it pulls it out. Okay. And so, no, this was, no, this was my first, um, I'm remembering now. This was my first uh, um, f- true free fall. So I jump Solo. out. I get steady. Right. I wasn't doing advanced free fall. So it's just me. Right. So right. I, I get steady and then I, you know, I, um, uh, I throw out and, um, I pull my chute and, and, and I remember, so I, it, there's enough resistance that it stands me up. Right. So I'm, I'm basically feet to the ground and I look up and I'm like, huh, that looks just like one of those malfunction videos that we watched about get two hours ago. Yeah, so I had a bag lock. It's called a bag lock. So my my parachute never came out of the deployment bag. 
So I'm looking up at this thing and I'm like, huh, all right. So I'm, video. Su- I'm, su- <laughs> I'm video. All right. So I'm supposed to pull on my ros- right. risers a couple times. So I yank on them a couple times. To try times to get it to like, oh, whoops, to open up, right? To get it to open up. I mean, and, it's and, exciting. And, and it doesn't do anything. And so I'm like, well, okay, I got to cut away. And this whole time I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm very matter of fact about it. And so I, I cut my shoot away and then you simultaneously pull your reserve shoot. Okay. So when you do that, you know, even with that bag above your head that's not doing anything, it's still resistance. It still slows you down, right? Mm-hmm. So now all of a sudden I cut my parachute away and I go ass over tea kettle. And all of a sudden I had that feeling of falling. And I got to tell you, to this day, it gives me goosebumps because it was absolutely terrifying. Because it was like, ah! Out of control. Yeah, well, it's like you're, you're, and all of a sudden you're like going head down in a dive. I wasn't ready for it. No. You're going head down in a dive towards Mother Earth. You know, your, your second shoot is starting How to come out. How fast do you out. think you're falling? How fast? It, it probably, I mean, it seemed like a million miles an hour. Right. It probably wasn't that much. And, you know, in my shoot, I remember my shoot coming off and I'm looking up at my shoot. So it's like completely horrible body position, right? And I'm looking up at my shoot and I'm yelling at it and I'm like, you better open up. And, like, you know, and it, and it like <laughs> opens up and I was like, oh, so I don't what was the AAR all about on the ground, the, man? I don't know if the skydiving thing's for me. Dude, who packed your <laughs> shoot? That was my very first, it was a freak accident. Yeah. I mean, that's why you have reserve, right? Right. And so, but so there you go. You want to ask about a hair raising? I did want that to know about it. that. That, that is hair it. raising. Yeah, because you, you're you always probably in control so much with you, what you do, your tasks, you know, taking things apart, putting them together, the weaponry, your parachute. You could probably pack your own chute for a static line, fold it up all the correct way, pull all the ropes and everything. So you're always in control. In that moment, you're not in control. It's like, okay, I'm done. Yeah. You're like, I'm not ready for this. Yeah. Right? It's not like getting on a roller coaster. You're like, okay, bar goes down. It's, it's off good, you go. It, it's good to experience your terror once in a while, though. Well, yeah, it because... It keeps you mortal. Yeah, you're alive. You're yeah, like, hey, you're I'm alive. still alive. Exactly. Oh, well, okay, that's a good thing. Well, that's, a cra- that's crazy. I mean, and I've heard some others. I have a friend that uh, has a tattoo on his arm, and he's got a C-130, and it's got a bunch of cigarette rolls uh, <laughs> of the guys that had... <laughs> had a mishap and the yeah. engine's on fire on a C-130. Oh, yeah. Lost a bunch of guys on this crazy jump. And I asked him, I was like, what's that all about? And he's like, well, let me tell you about the cigarette rolls on my arm and what they're all representing each dude that didn't make it. Wow. Yeah. So Damn. that, yeah, that was static lines. They just all the way down. Wow. Yeah. They didn't pull the reserves? I... I guess not. That's a story I heard. That's the story. So I'm going to go with that lore right there, okay? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, I, I just want to kind of come at you, and uh, let me see if Zach. Zach, are you hanging out with me right now? Yes, I am. Good, sir. Zach, how are we rolling on my uh, time limit? With uh... You are at 32 minutes and 30 seconds. So let me just kind of do Rad's rapid-fire questions. I have a little bit of some questions that I'm going to ask you, and this is rapid-fire with Rad. Lay it so on me. So you just kind of give me your best answer uh, as we go, Okay. So, favorite color? Green. Green. Favorite food? Oh, Indian curry. Yeah, chicken curry, without a doubt. I think I was Indian in another life. Okay. Well, that's another show. I'm pretty sure. I could talk to you about that. That's that's deep right there. I I love Indian food. And uh, yellow curry with chicken. So, that's your thing? Oh, bro. Okay, yellow curry with chicken sent over to the Ready Man offices. (laughs) Go ahead and flood that in. What's the last TV show you watched? Umi Zumi. Umi Zumi, because you have kids. I have. I've got a. I've got a five year old. And, and what is their her his name? Max. Max. Yeah. So I've got Odin <laughs> is my oldest, and Max is my uh, is my youngest. Well, uh, they're going to be very. Pr- they're and very then, proud of you. And then we have a little foster daughter too. That she's, oh, okay. she's like two and a half years old, and I can't say her name on the on the show. But, That's fine. Uh, That's fine. Yeah, we'll just call her D. So and, you're a dad. Uh, you're a dad, a father, yeah, husband, yeah, family man. Very much so, and uh, love it. Love every second of it. Where's the last place that you vacationed? When was the last time I was on a vacation? Oh, we went out to my business partner's place in Hawaii. Well, there you go. And, and uh, took the whole family out there, went scuba diving, shot some Had fish. some mental health time for yourself. It was good, yeah. That's, what I, that's yeah. why I'm asking that question. Yeah. Pretty much, if you come on my show on Fired Up with Rad, then you're going to hear me ask you that because I believe in mental health and what frees your mind from your yeah. regular hey. crazy times. Amen, brother. I believe it. Uh, and the last book that you have read? Uh, the last book I read was the final read on one of the books that Jason and I just finished writing. Excuse me, which was 
uh, the last Air Force One. So Black Autumn, the last Air Force One. That's right, because you're also an accomplished author, and you have books and manuals out there. Where, um, let me ask you this question: uh, What is your favorite kind of music or band? Heavy metal. Heavy metal. What falls into heavy metal for you? I want to know what uh, you consider I, I'm, I heavy mean, metal, bro. Because I know what I. It's so like in the '80s, it yeah. was like the regular heavy metal, and as I've gotten older, I mean, I'm I'm almost 50 now, like Metallica. Like Metallica, Metallica. Back in the 80s and stuff, huh? but um, now I mean I listen to I'm I'm kind of out of my age bracket, but I mean I listen to like um, um, Parkway Drive and sure. Five Finger Death Punch okay. and Kill Switch Engage and there's something about that music that actually calms me. That's cool. So I hope that those out there listening also can appreciate what music does for the soul. And um, I just want to say it's been a really great time having you on uh, Fired Up with Rad. And I will have you back on this show at another point. Looking forward to it. Bro, I just want to say thanks for all you've done for my country and for the people of other countries. And, um, you know, thanks for serving at the 19th. And uh, I just want to shake your hand. Thanks so much. Oh, and also... Uh, as as my first guest, I'm going to award you with this War Machine patch right here. Nice. Let me show that off. Let's see if I can get that You'll on there. you have to there. show it to that camera. Oh, there, there we go. go. So that's the War Machine. So I have a tank and uh, a friend of mine named Felicia, whose uh, significant other is also 19th group, oh, okay. Airborne, uh, Trevin. They made this and uh, I'm going to offer it to you. Wow, well, thank okay. you They're very limited, much. one of 30. Oh, nice. Okay, so you have number 30. Oh, I just okay. randomly hand them out, so the number is not specific. And then I'm sitting in the top of the turret right that. there. I see that. And it was designed on the Scooby Mobile. She kind of like <laughs> manipulated it to look like That's you know awesome. a good time because I just want you to have a this good is, time. This is even better because I am a van guy. Okay. I, I love driving It's vans. IR too. Oh, nice. Yeah, so you know nods, PBS 14s. My dudes will be able to see me when I'm assaulting targets. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you and invite you out to war games with me anytime that I ever run them. And uh, if you have any questions about survival uh, and you want to learn more about Ready Man Team, then you can go to Ready Man Media on Facebook. Yep. Uh, what other websites can we check you out on, please? So readyman.com. You can check us out on Facebook, Ready Man Media. You can check us out on Instagram with Ready Man Network or just regular Ready Man. Um, but, uh, yeah, when we put out, you know, we do a couple live shows a week and, and just, you know, we're all about trying to spread the word of emer emergency preparedness and survival and just right. being ready in case something bad happens. In case. Break in case. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, thanks again for being on Fired Up with Rad, and I look forward to having you on the show in a future uh, episode. So thanks again. You too, man. All right, cool. Thanks. All right, peace.